Howdy, folks. I'm Blingy Brian. Hi, I'm Amber. And here's some sparkles. Ooh. All right, folks. Our first letter is titled, Am I a jerk for telling my wife that she isn't a princess? For the past several months, she has been eerily acting like a child. I understand that she's playing along with our daughter, but it comes across as weird to me to the degree that she plays the role. Our daughter wanted a mini pizza, so she asked me to make her one. I was, and then my wife said me too because I'm a princess too. I told her no, you're an adult, not a princess. I'll make you one, but you're an adult. She laughed and nervously said, okay, never mind. Our daughter heard and said, dad, mom is a princess too. I just said, mm-hmm, agreeing, but I didn't want to have to explain it to her. I did feel bad because my wife changed out her princess clothes too, but I don't know whether or not this whole ordeal makes me a jerk. All right, folks, what do you think? Jerk or not the jerk? Yes, OP's being a jerk here. Like, let people have their fun. It seems like his wife knows she's not actually royalty. Like, so it's just a fun little bit of make-believe. I mean... Certainly, if he is concerned about her mental health and well-being, that's one matter, but that's something that he needs to kind of address and talk with her about. But this sounds more like pretend and make-believe. Right. It's not like she's like, oh, we need to go to Buckingham Palace so I can resume my rightful place or something. Yeah. Well, she he says that she's been acting like a kid for the last few weeks, acting like a child. So I don't know exactly what that means. It sounds like she's just been playing enjoying and dress playing up with the kid. Yeah. Which I mean is a great thing to do. And I think it's really silly that we discourage people from embracing their everything that they like. But they because you don't outgrow have to outgrow these sort of things. Like I'm a Disney bounder. There are a lot of active adult Disney bounders who dress up as princesses regularly. And like that's totally fine and really awesome and like i feel re it's really a shame that we push adults to like give up on dressing up and you know having fun pretending to be someone else just because you're over a certain age unless they're million dollar actors mm -hmm. then you can dress up and play costume all you want and everyone will think it's normal and in fact really great so again like if this is a mental health concern because he's really worried about some kind of weird issue, because we've had an incident in the past a long time ago where the guy was kind of acting like a child in the middle of a supermarket having a like a breakdown. But it turns out that that was actually like him taking a bet. <laughs> so not not him actually acting like a child. And I think that this is just a incident of her just playing along with her kid and playing make believe, which there's nothing wrong with that. So let me know what you folks think. Anyhow, take care and good luck. Thesa Flower says, without further details, I have to say you're the jerk unless she is playing princess all day, every day, and not dropping the act to engage with you as an adult. It sh sounds like she is just playing with your daughter on a kid's level. Asking you for a mini pizza while she's still playing with the kid doesn't really sound like a problem. And OP replies, the act sometimes continues outside of the play time with me. It's off-putting. So, Ephineal Sadii says, so your wife plays at being a princess with your daughter, and when you're alone sometimes she wants to continue to roleplay for some more adult purposes. Am I understanding correctly? And you're not into it because you see it as childlike and creepy in that context? Dude, the time to address this is privately with your wife, not when she's engaged in innocent play with your daughter. Obviously, you're not required to participate in anything you don't want to, but I would suggest talking to your wife about it when she gets out of this fantasy, the adult version, I mean. And OP replies, precisely, it's not like I haven't said anything in the past either. I've told her to stop. It's the overlap that bothers me so much. I mean, that kind of just got a little weird fast but mm -hmm. I, again this is the time to address it is behind closed doors mm -hmm. not not in front of your daughter mm -hmm. so i think that that certainly is you know, adults need to kind of have a uniform front in front of their kids so that kids don't get the idea that one parent is bossing another parent around so i think that that's that kit sounds a little problematic. And Nailgun198 says, the only correct no response to, 
I'm a princess too, was no, you're not, you're a queen, you're the jerk. Look at those awards, it's like filling the screen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot there. All right, folks, our next letter is titled, Am I a jerk for ignoring my husband after he ignored me in the hospital? This is going to be a long one, so buckle up but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. My husband is a 24-year-old male and he's visiting his family in Florida. I'm a 24-year-old female visiting mine in Pennsylvania. I'm currently 20 weeks pregnant with my first child. The past few days, I was having pretty bad cramping, which I thought was just maybe some Braxton Hicks or rounds of ligament pain, so I ignored it. Well, yesterday, I started getting severely worse and there was blood in my urine. I waited a few hours, but when the pain didn't go away, I called my husband and informed him that I was going to the ER. I was told it was a severe UTI on the verge of becoming a kidney infection, which was causing me to have contractions along with a fever. I texted my husband about 20 times while in the hospital and I didn't get a response. After I was finally discharged, I called him and he was absolutely just wasted. Of of course I get angry at him. I inform him that I'm angry and say that I don't want to speak to him tonight. Well, he decided to start messaging his family group chat that I am a part of, also Discord server that I talk to all of my online friends in because I wasn't responding to his text messages. I'll copy a couple of the messages. I'm sorry, but I'm not even allowed to drink. I came home to visit my family one time and I drank once. I'm sorry that I wanted to spend time with my family once having fun. If you never wanted me to drink and spend time with my family, then expletive, I'll never talk to them again. But my dad died and I see them for the first time since and you are mad that I drank with them once? And okay, sorry I wanted to have a drink one time with my family after my dad passed. I'll never take a sip of alcohol again just for you. For reference, his dad passed away seven months ago. I have never told my husband that he's not allowed to drink. I even encouraged him multiple times to go out with his family and made the plans for him to visit them. I immediately called him to try to mediate and calm him down and to stop the embarrassment that he was causing me. But instead, his sister answers the phone. She goes on to tell me that I just need to learn to trust that her and his family told him to stay off his phone and to relax and have fun since it was his last night there that I need to let the past go and that I'm being sensitive and dramatic due to being pregnant. And then he ignored me for the rest of the night. Now I just need to know, am I the jerk in this situation? Edited to add, he was not drunk before I went to the hospital. I spoke with him on the phone prior. All right, folks, what do you think? Jerk or not the jerk? Not the jerk. I mean, I understand wanting to unwind with your family, but when your partner is in the hospital and they don't know if there's something seriously wrong, that is not the time to do it. You know, I don't know that I would be able to relax and have a fun time right. while knowing that my wife was in the hospital. Well, that's the thing. Like, who's like, yeah, I'm going to go just unwind now that you are having some serious, potentially serious issues. Yeah. I understand that this was his last night there and that maybe he wanted to go out and have fun and with his friends and family, but life happens. He's going to be a father soon and also being a father is going to be involved having father responsibilities and he's not acting like a good partner in this case either well no because on top of that you know then he goes to blow up all these messenger chat messages trying to make it look like op is the villain here mm -hmm. like what he is doing is a very bad sign of things to come. Oh, yeah. It's very manipulative. I don't like it at all. I think that he's being really gross here, and it sets off major red flags for me. Same. So I think that at the very minimum, he needs to go into therapy, but I don't know even know if this relationship is something that OP should pursue. Right. Like, it depends on is this a one-off thing that happened, or is this 
a consistent pattern of behavior. I mean, even if it's a one-off, like this is a, a big enough thing, the manipulation to be to really re-examine it. Yeah, well, and, the manipulation on top of sending his family after mm -hmm. them and then painting, like being a giant soft story, oh, what was me type of thing, and turning around like her medical emergency into an inconvenience for him. Yeah, well, I guess that's the... That's the biggest issue right there is like he just seemed to have zero concern about her. He was unreachable, you know, and so like even I know sometimes people when they get worried, they drink, but it doesn't even seem like that because he's not even reachable. He's just mm -hmm. out there celebrating. And uh, I don't know this. This gives me really bad, really bad vibes. Yeah. And sometimes people don't start showing their manipulative side until their partner is already married to them and pregnant and yeah. so it could be that this is new behavior even if it is like that's very worrying yeah it could just be that in his mind op is like locked down mm -hmm. and so she has no other choice but to be with him and i do know that that's kind of like to some degree what happens with some abusive individuals so they of course don't start off abusive but sometimes people just flip after the first kid or any number of things so op i would really seriously reconsider this relationship but let me know what you folks think anyhow take care and good luck and intelligent pie 5947 says not the jerk wow okay he is invalidating your feelings on the basis of your hormones this one always infuriates me but since i'm a woman it must mean that i'm ps pmsing so don't worry my anger actually means nothing <laughs> He is setting forth a narrative to get outside people on his side for a disagreement that should have been just between the two of you. And I have not read anything here that indicates that he has any concern whatsoever for his unborn child. Plus, you went separately to see your families, didn't go together, he didn't want to go with his pregnant wife, you are not the jerk, but you have some problems here. And OP replies, I was with him and his family for a week and decided to spend a second week with my family. I told him that since he didn't get to spend as much time as he wanted and needed after his father passed, that he should stay with his family longer. All right, folks, it is tea time. Grab your beverages of choice. I've got some tea right here. Amber, she has a joke. Why did they quit giving tests at the zoo? Oh, well... This is really embarrassing. When I was at the zoo, mind you, I was on the other side of the bars. You can take that how you want. <laughs> and I embarrassingly did not pass my kangaroo test. And the reason why is they said, Brian, you're not a kangaroo. And I said, yes, I am. I've got the hopping down. I've got the pouch. I had a little hoodie on. And um, I had like the boxing gloves and they're like, no, you, you need to leave. You're not welcome here. And that's, that's when they escorted me off the property. And that's why they don't have tests at the zoo anymore. Because it was full of cheetahs. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. They were all trying to cheat. <laughs> I, I, I don't know how I didn't pass my test. It's ridiculous. And Gary, Gary? He didn't look anything like a kangaroo. Nothing like a kangaroo. He, he, he kind of looked like a, a, a rabbit. A very large rabbit. The very big feet. A pouch. I don't know. Something like that. Weird rabbit. Mutant giant rabbit. And I have Mega Mint Tea. <laughs> All right, folks. And there may be a little bit of a, a special bit in here so i'm going to read you a bit of text that i'm working on for amber it's a story it's going to be a story kind of in 12 parts it's going to be uh, based around the horoscope around the uh, zodiac so i'll just read it and let you folks see what we've been up to so this is just a side project it's for amber's birthday mm -hmm. so officious the serpent bearer it's rumored that there's a 13th sign of the Zodiac, Officius, known as the Snake Charmer, said to fall between Scorpio and Sagittarius. It is depicted as a man bearing a serpent riding a scorpion. Make no mistake, it is an aberration, an unwelcome guest, a thief, a parasite, a poltergeist. Ephemeral in nature, its presence poisons the waters of life, turning them bitter and sallow. 
Constantly on the move, its embodiment lives a charmed life while those around it wither and decay. It was the last day of November. The trickling of melting snow mingled with the somber calls of the birds in the early morning air. A dense patchwork of fog wove its way between the trees and blanketed the crater-pocked road. The distant rumble of a diesel engine echoed through the calm. The engine revved lower, followed by a hissing of its hydraulic brakes. The chatter of birds died as though they had been spooked by a predator. The howl of the engine intensified as the ghostly white moving van emerged from the thinning fog and bumped and creaked its way down Main Street. A pair of onlookers stood frozen in their tracks, watching as the vehicle glided around one of the many potholes that lined the muddy, loam-covered street. Metal scraped past metal as one of the wheels tore into the cavity, rattling the vehicle and spilling chips of tar and gravel onto the surface of the road. One of the men doffed his winter jacket, the chill that had settled over the dusty little hamlet of Polaris for the last month had disappeared, giving the residents a short reprieve from the early winter. A nearby child jumped into a puddle that had accumulated from the piles of dripping snow that had lined the sidewalk. The glittering surfaces shrunk under the warm glow of the sun as it danced out from behind the errant puff that pocked the otherwise pale blue sky one of the few traces of the clouds that had swallowed the horizon only days before. The man exchanged whispers as the van turned onto a side road. It slowed before finally coming to a rest in front of the decrepit Victorian manor, a building that looked so frail that the townsfolk had been taking bets for years as to when it would come down. A pair of men dressed in the same drab white as their truck exited the cab and strolled to the back of the vehicle. A deafening shockwave ricocheted against the walls of the houses and trees, like the first roll of thunder before a storm, as one of the men wrenched open the roll-up door, revealing a densely packed trove of long-lost treasures decorated in mahogany and gold leaf. The other man trudged over to the large pair of black double doors at the center of the grand manor. Jangling filled the air as he worked an oversized key ring from his belt. He grasped an ornate brass key, nearly the same size as the length of his hand, that would have been better suited on the set of a movie than fixed next to its diminutive compatriots. The remaining keys fell to the other side of the ring, huddling from the monstrous key, their cries piercing the air as the man pushed the behemoth into the lock. A groan filled the air, the gurgling of a stomach upon the first waft of a feast before the end of a long fast. The pair began to systematically unpack the contents of the vehicle. They worked like a pair of grotesque hands, shoveling food into the gaping maw of some unearthly devil. The new life seemed to fill the once abandoned structure. The graying walls appeared brighter and less chipped. Areas once bowed with the passage of time now seemed straighter and taller, filled with a renewed sense of dignity. Like ants discovering a discarded treat, the townsfolk took turns patrolling the street, craning their necks, searching for some morsel that would satisfy their curiosity. At first, they were careful not to show too much interest, lest their neighbors judge them for being nosy, trickling in one at a time. The steady prying chipped and eventually broke their last remaining reservations until a diminutive crowd coagulated at the artery that branched out into Silver Way, chattering about every item moved from the van with any neighbor who would pass by. Would you look at that? One of the onlookers trilled as they pushed a pair of gold-rimmed spectacles up their hawkish nose. The men shuffled out of the back of the moving van, straining under the weight of the eight-legged throne. One of the men held the sprawling tail that curved over the top of the chair, while the other attempted to grasp the pair of scorpion claws carved into the armrests. Brass tacks glimmered in the sunlight, pinning the blood-red leather cushion segments against the mahogany frame as the men waddled out of the shadows. One of the members of the audience detached from the group, turning around and grasping her necklace as though it were a lifeline in a vast ocean. She hurried away, her graying bun bouncing like a pendulum, all the while praying aloud that her town be freed from the devil's grip. Murmurs followed in her wake as the crowd prattled on about the throne. 
The somnolent town vibrated with an energy it hadn't in years. As the hours passed, the crowd dissolved. All that remained were quiet whispers that spilled out of the resident's mouth, filling every corner with rumors about their new inhabitant. Children spoke of vampires, men of a wealthy mistress, and women of a lonely poet looking to share his good fortune. The townsfolk devoured the news of every last box, couch, and hutch until the final item was unpacked and the van had disappeared past the decaying sign that read Polaris, established 1824. The townsfolk continued their patrols for several hours, scouring the stretch of road leading to the manor for some crumb that they could carry back to their home. The frantic energy slowly evaporated, and they settled down onto their couches for the evening to watch final rounds of static field game shows that flashed across their phosphorus lace screens. All that remained of the day's events were the last vestiges of the whispers which echoed through their thoughts. Long after the women put their children to bed and the men settled under the covers for the evening, a single light flicked on. A beast, awakened from a long slumber, studying the outside world through the pale yellow glow of a single eye. And so that's the start, uh, a rough draft, a draft of my first prologue so we'll see how that goes i really like it i'm super excited for this so let me know what you folks think tell brian it's amazing all right folks that's all the time we have for today thanks so much for watching happy tuesday spelt with t-w-o amber we need some moral guidance and i'll let you have free reign today all the moral guidance we need is the Brian Toner is a great writer, and we need to all encourage him to keep writing his story. So I get this book because I really want to read it. Uh, but I'll give you another moral, too, because that's not really a moral. That's just me begging Brian to write a book. Um, so let's see. I mean, I think a moral takeaway is that uh, one good moral takeaway, I think, is that if your partner doesn't really seem concerned when you could be in serious like having a serious health scare pay attention to that that's a sign of things to come you know if he's not concerned now and i know luckily it turned out to be something that's treatable it's a bad bad sign so you know if anyone's in that situation just just pay attention to that think long and hard about that situation if your partner doesn't have your best interests in mind and neglects you in your time of need then maybe it's time to find a new partner yes exactly Thanks so much for watching, and we will see you all tomorrow. Bye.